Well, this morning, if you have a Bible with you, I ask that you'll find with me Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and this morning we're going to be talking about how to have harmony in the church. There are three words that sound very, very similar. The word unity, union, and uniformity. And those words sound similar, but they're very, very different. You realize that we can have union without having unity. I think about the number of people who are married, who have entered into a marriage union, but spend a little bit of time with them and you'll find out they don't have unity. Somebody once said you could take two tomcats and tie their tails together, throw them over a clothesline, and you've got union, but you don't have unity. That's true in the local church. We can have union by being members together of one another, but yet we don't necessarily have unity if we're not of one mind walking together in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I read a while back an article about the, the number, or a story a number of years ago. It was reported that there was a church in Dallas, Texas, and this made the newspapers there in Dallas that was having a, a fight. And uh, there was one group in the church that was trying to take control of the property from the others and have them evicted. And this went to a local court. And the judge was wise enough in that situation to say that uh, this was not a matter for a secular court to decide. In this particular denomination, it did have an ecclesiastical or a church court, and he referred the matter back to them. And the decision of the court was to take uh, was to give, to award the property to one of the factions within the church. And, uh, of course, the other group left. They went down the road just a short distance and started a new church, kind of the American way of church uh, growth there. But the thing that's so interesting is the Dallas paper decided to further investigate, and they found that the entire dispute began... When one of the elders of the church was served a smaller, thinner slice of ham than a child seated next to him at a church dinner. And, and as ridiculous as that might sound to you, in my observation through the years, seeing most church fights, they're not over major doctrinal issues. It's usually over something kind of goofy or silly or unimportant. But as we think about these things like unity, union, and uniformity. On the other hand, you can have something like uniformity where everybody kind of looks like each other. You can take a military unit, you can put everybody in the same uniform. Outwardly, they all look the same, but those of you who have served maybe in the service can, can probably attest to it at various times when you've been in a unit that had uh, on a similar uniform, but there wasn't necessarily unity together. There can be disruption. U unity comes from within where uniformity and union come from without. There are exterior kind of ideas that were held together, but unity, it is, a, it is something that is shared together within. And we're going to look at how to have unity in the church and look at a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning. The thing about it is in Philippians chapter 2, these are verses that you all know very well. But most of the time when we read them, we think about the doctrine of Christ, who Jesus is, what he did for us when he became human, how he suffered on the cross, how he has been exalted. And while it is a wonderful reminder of the doctrine of Christ, if we read it in its context, you'll find that it actually is Paul's recipe for unity in the church. Listen to what he says here. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each, one, each esteem others better than himself. Let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or did not uh, consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death 
of the cross. And therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we think about this text and what it tells us about how to have harmony in the church, I'm reminded of the essentials of humble service. In verses 1 through 4, you'll notice that Paul is giving this conditional statement, if you will. Now, now those verses in English might look like a variety of statements and, and sentences, but in Greek it is actually one single sentence. Verses 1 to 4 is one single sentence in Greek. And what Paul is laying out as he talks about these essentials of humble service is he first of all talks about having the right motivation. There in verse 1, uh, he begins with this conditional, uh, these conditional sentences where he says, if, if there's this, if there's that, if there, four times in verse 1 he says, if. Now, actually, if you go ahead and try to understand what he's saying, he's really saying because, not if. Because the conditional thing, if there's this, the answer to every if is, yes, there is. It's kind of like saying, you know, if Jesus loves us, right? And we know the answer is that he does. And Paul knows that they know the answer is, yes, he does. And, and so what he's getting at is saying, because of all these wonderful things that we have in Jesus, we ought to do the right thing and to humbly serve one another. If you want to boil it down to having the right motivation, the right motivation for being unified together as a church is spelled like this, J-E-S-U-S. It's spelled Jesus. The motivation that you ought to have and I ought to have ought to be Jesus. And he lays that out. He talks about if there's any consolation or any encouragement in Christ. Is there any encouragement in Christ? Absolutely there is. There's the encouragement that we have that our sins are forgiven, that we have a hope, that we have a Savior, and we know that we have consolation in Christ. And therefore, we ought to fulfill His joy by being like-minded of the same mind. He says, is, if there's any charity, or any love, any comfort of love in Christ, aren't you thankful that Jesus loves you? And because Jesus loves you, He's called us to love one another. And He talks about the communion we have. Is there any fellowship of the Spirit. You see, through the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ, we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and He gives us unity of the Spirit in the church. And then we also know that there is a comfort, affection, and mercy He speaks of as well. We are to have a compassion because of the compassion of Christ. Last week, we very talked about this very thing, that the Lord loves us, and His love for us then enables us to love others. Remember Ephesians 432, uh, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. And the love that God has demonstrated to you when you were a sinner is therefore then the ability that you have, the motivation you have to love others. And so we must understand that our motivation to be united together in Christ is all of these things that God has done for us. And if God has done this for us, then we can be motivated to be like-minded because that's what our Lord Jesus has called us to do. And so we have to have the right motivation. We have to be motivated to love out of uh, obedience to Jesus, but also we have to have the right method. You know, a person can have the right motive without having the right method. I imagine that anyone who starts a business has the right motive. Their motive, if you start a business, is to make money, right? Right? It is to have a profit, but not everybody who begins and starts their own business succeeds in that business because perhaps they use the wrong method. But, but yet in the church, we can have the right motive. We can desire to be unified, but we can have a very bad method. I, I've met plenty of people who would say, I want us to be unified together, and then everything about their toxic behavior leads to disunity. And so how do we have it? He says, we have it by having harmony. He says, fulfill my joy by being, notice there, like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one mind. 
Now, you say, does that mean that we all have to think the exact same thing, that we all have to be exactly alike? It sounds like uh, a lot like uniformity, Pastor. Well, he's talking here about having uh, the, our, our thoughts on the same Lord. Ha- having our unity, something that we can agree on. I understand in the church, there are a lot of different people. I, hear, I look out across this room and I see different faces. I, I realize that every one of you is very different from each other. Some of you are maybe more alike than others, and some of you are more different in the way that you look at the world, your perspective, your worldview, but hey, there's a lot of diversity here. Now, our orchestra didn't play this morning, but when, you, when they do, and they play very often, they've had a little bit of a break here in this month, but, and, and by the way, if you play an instrument, I would love to have you in our orchestra, but there's, there's, the thing about this orchestra is we've got different instruments, but when you hear the orchestra play, you realize that they can play in harmony because they're focused on the same notes and, and and even though there are different instruments uh, playing together the same thing allows there to be a harmony together and as I think about how a church is to have harmony together the right methodology means that we have to understand that we have the same God that we ought to have the same goal and that we ought to have the same guide see our God is the Lord Jesus Christ And we have to have unity in Him. We have to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Our goal is the Great Commission. If you don't know what we're supposed to be doing, it is to be making disciples and baptizing those who are lost. Letting them come to know Christ and making disciples of them. The reason a lot of churches uh, that are united together in a lot of ways and believe some of the same things can't seem to get on the same page is because they don't have the same goal. One of them is trying to, to, to just make sure it's a country club for saints rather than trying to make it a place where they're growing and training up people to know Jesus Christ and to grow in a relationship with Him. And, and we, have to have the, we have the same God, we, we have the same goal, and we cannot forget we're to have the same guide. This book that I hold in my hand, this is the Bible, and it is the inerrant, it is the infallible, and it is the inspired Word of God, and it is without any errors. And you understand that this book is to be our guide. As I look around the world today, I see a lot of churches that are having division. I see denominations that are in a free fall. And the reason they are is because they have forgotten that this is the book. And when you start trying to say that truth changes with culture, culture changes, but God's truth has never changed. And we must stick to the book if we're going to have unity. You see, we can't have unity if we don't agree on what God's Word says. It's better to be uh, divided over truth than united in error. And so we we must understand that if we're going to have harmony. But once we understand that, we have the right guide, and we have the same God, and we have the same goal, that we can go in the same direction. You know, if I were to take two pieces of wood, two blocks of wood, I could rub them together in opposite directions and need to have what you call friction two different things going in opposite directions moving together in opposite directions creates friction and that happens very often in the church we have a, a group of people and, and they're they're together but they're moving in opposite directions and it's causing friction sometimes it's happening in your home you don't have the same goals the same shared mindset By the way, that's why it's so important that you're equally yoked in Christ. But in the church, it's so important that we be united together going in the same direction. I think about our nation and the success that we had during the Second World War. And why? Because we understood as a nation that whether you were a Democrat or whether you were a Republican, that there was one goal, it was winning a war. And so everybody did his and her part in the nation to win the war. And then you look at what happened in the 1960s, in the 1970s with the Vietnam War, and you see that the difference was is that the nation was not united. We were going in different directions. And so in the church, if we're going to have success in doing what God has called us to do, we have to have harmony as our method. And we have to have humility as part of that method as well. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. So often we think about what it means to have humility, and we think it means just kind of being self 
uh, depreciating or, or uh, the fact that we uh, don't brag a lot about ourselves. But when he talks about doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, one of the things in churches that ca- often causes a great deal of disunity is that everybody has ambition. You see, uh, uh, one group over here has ambition to get their goals, their needs met. And this group over here has a different set of goals, has a different ministry. And they want all the money, they want all the resources for their ministry. I know of a church that uh, they had a lot of different kinds of ministries going on. And there was a big fight because uh, there was, you know, it always comes down to money. And obviously the way we spend our money shows where our goals are and what we're trying to do, what's good for everybody versus what's good for some. And this particular place, there was, uh, there was some money and one group of men, they, liked to, uh, they were kind of leaders in the church and they, they liked to play on a basketball court outside. And so uh, they, they wanted the money to be spent to fix their basketball court. And then there was another group over here that, Hey, that, they were on a cemetery committee, and they wanted all the money to be put in the cemetery. And this group over here wanted it to be put in the building fund, and it, it, got, it got to be a big fight. You see, what the problem was is that there was selfish ambition and conceit. Everybody wanted what was in their best interest rather than what was in the best interest of the church and the best interest of others. The reason you say, well, why, do I, why does my desire for the church need to be what we do? Because people are doing things out of selfish ambition and conceit. And Paul says in Romans 12, do not think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think, but rather think of yourself in sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. In other words, we, as he says here, we ought to think with each of, of ourselves with lowliness of mind. Now, humility means not that we, as Andrew Murray said, not that we think less of ourselves is that we don't think about ourselves at all that we're thinking about what is best for others sometimes the Lord just needs to convict our hearts and show us where we're wrong and when we're wrong so that we'd have a humility to put the needs of others in the church above our own needs And then also, not only do we do all things with harmony, not only all things with humility, but also with helpfulness. Look at what he says in verse 4. And let each one of you not look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. We have to be willing, ready, and able to help where there's a need in the church. I'll tell you something about myself, and by the way, I'm afraid to say this because as soon as I say it, I'll probably, it'll happen to me this week. But so far in my 36 years of life, I have never ran out of gas. Now, I'm afraid to say it. It may happen yet. But so far it hasn't. And let me tell you why it probably hasn't happened. I mean, maybe because I've been, you know, been saved by a few gas stations a few times when I needed it. But the other thing is, I, I, I kind of monitor certain things. There's certain things that I, I, I'm looking at. Why? Because I'm concerned about myself. I don't want to be walking down the road having to try to find a gas can. I'm thinking about what my needs are before I find myself in a, need, in, a, in, a, in a time of need. Now, I'm thinking about myself just like you're thinking about yourself. You, you may forget to look at your gas gauge, but there are certain things in your life that you're thinking about. You're thinking about where you're going to get your next meal. You're thinking about what you need to get by. But how often do you think about those things for others? You see, I would be a lot better off in my spiritual life if I would spend more time thinking about not only my own needs and anticipating those needs, but if I would anticipate the needs of others. Do you think about others in this church? I mean, how how much time do you spend thinking about, is this person taken care of am I meeting that one's needs what what I can foresee that they're going to be lonely they're 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 going to be discouraged are we thinking about others there needs to be a spirit of not only humility but also of helpfulness as we're to have harmony in the church and that is the method we use to have harmony we have to be motivated by our love for Jesus and our method is showing this love and concern for others with these attitudes now, we often we think about the essentials of humble service, but also he gives us the example 
of humble service. Look at verse 5. You'll notice here is right before he goes into this description about Jesus and all that he did, he doesn't say, let this theology drive your Christology. And he could say that, and he does inform us about who Jesus was and what he did, and it should drive our Christology and our idea of who Jesus was. What he writes in verses 6 to 11 does change the way I view Christ. It needs to inform that I understand that he was always God and that he is exalted and all the various theological questions we could have. But the primary reason he describes what he describes here is so that you would follow his example. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So how does he describe that? He describes the attitude that Jesus had. And by the way, if we would follow the attitude that Jesus has here in these verses, if this would be our example for how we live and how we treat others in the church, there wouldn't be any problems in the local church. Karl Barth once said that there would be no New Testament if it weren't for the problems of the local church. I had a man tell me one time when I was uh, pastoring in Kentucky, he had been visiting our church, and he was a very critical man, and he came to the door and he said, Pastor, he said, uh, there are a lot of problems in this church. And I thought, yeah, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, you just try this job for a week, you figure it out. There are a lot of problems in this church. He said, Pastor, he said, I don't think you ought to do this. This is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. And he started give me a list. You know what I told him? I said, well, I said, that's kind of like the church at Corinth where a man was sleeping with his mother-in-law. It's kind of like the church at Corinth where they were taking each other to court or they were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. Or what about uh, the, the church at Ephesus that had lost its first love or the church at Laodicea? That have become so lukewarm. And we can go down and down through the scriptures and see that each one of these churches had great problems. And that's why Paul writes when he writes to the church at Philippi to remind them the way to overcome these issues is to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how did he set an example for us? He set an example for us in verse 6 through his selflessness. Notice it says, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he took on the form of a servant. Now, there are some people who have gotten confused about this. I do want to correct the mistaken view of Christology here. Some people think that when Jesus became God, when the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, took on human flesh, that somehow he ceased to be God in order to become human. No, he was always God. Jesus Christ was God from eternity past. Now, he wasn't human until he took on flesh. But when he took on flesh... There was no part of his divinity that was sacrificed. Somebody explained it one time as subtraction by addition. He said, what do you mean by that? We can explain it to you like this. By the way, I like cars. Somebody told me last night there was a great car show in which I missed it. But I was at a car show several years ago in another state. And and they had, uh, I saw in the course of the show, hundreds of cars there, maybe thousands. And uh, there were three 1969 Mustang Shelbys. And every one of them had a price tag on it. And the price tag, I heard somebody say amen. Yeah, wait till you say, you might say oh me when you hear how much they were. Every one of them was over $100,000. Now, the thing about that is this. You take a 1969 Mustang Shelby, $105,000, $110,000, whatever it's worth, and, and let's say that you could take that and you take a bunch of mud, filter that mud, at least get all the, the rocks out of it so it doesn't scratch the paint, right? And, 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 and you just placed it and covered that car with mud. And I, don't let it get down in the engine. Don't let, don't let it get in the interior. But that car is covered with mud. So that when you look at it, you don't even know what it is. Is that car still as valuable? It is. But you can't see the value, you can't see what you're dealing with because it's covered with mud. And when Jesus Christ took on human flesh, was he still God? Was he still as infinitely valuable as he is? Absolutely, but we could not see who he was because he took on humanity. And so there was subtraction, if you will, by the addition of humanity. 
Now, as I think about that, though, the fact that he was willing to do that, the fact that he was willing to humble himself was a symbol, was a sign of the fact of his great love for us. And what we need to be willing to do is be selfless for the sake of others. To, to realize that just as, as he couldn't be forced to take on flesh, he could have remained in heaven and let everyone else go to hell and there would have been nothing wrong with that. We ought to be willing to say, I'm willing to set aside my own desires for the sake of others. I'm willing to humble myself and do not what's best for me, but what's best for you. That's the attitude we ought to have, an, act, an attitude of selflessness. And then an act of service. It says there, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus Christ was still God. He was still just as great, but yet he came in the form of a servant because the Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. My question is, are you willing to serve others? Some people think they're great. Some people may have a very high opinion of themselves and they think, you know what, I'm too good to serve. Or at least if I'm going to serve, I want to serve in a place of prominence. I want to be a leader. I want to be a teacher. I want to be asked to do this. I don't want to be asked to work in the nursery. I don't want to be asked to clean a restroom. I don't want to be asked to go and spend my day in the clothing closet. But we're never greater than when we're serving. There was a great scholar by the name of F.F. F. Bruce. He was British. He taught at the University of Manchester for many years. In my office, I have many of his commentaries. And in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and even the 1980s, he was the world-renowned evangelical scholar. The most prominent, most prestigious name among any New Testament professor anywhere in the world. And I heard about a man who wanted to hear, but he knew that F.F. F. Bruce taught, at a, taught a Sunday school class in a small church somewhere around Manchester, and the man was in England, and he was in the area on a Sunday, so he wanted to go and to sit through F.F. F. Bruce, Bruce's Sunday school class. And so he, he didn't know, he figured there'd be a lot of visitors there. He got there at the church very early, and uh, he was the first car in the parking lot. And so he, he saw that they had a, a coal-burning stove. Somebody was there tending the stove. He knocked on the door. The man opened the door, and he says, Hey, uh, I'm here for F.F. Uh, F. Bruce's Sunday school class here in just a few Few, uh, next, uh, I think it was in the next hour or so it was going to be starting. So the man led him in, and he was wearing coveralls all covered with grease, and, and, and he sat him down. And, and uh, anyway, just a few minutes later, he came in, and the man began to wash his hands, get some of the soot off of his face, and to take those coveralls off, and he was wearing a suit underneath. And he realized that was F.F. F. Bruce. That great world-renowned New Testament scholar was the man who showed up early to start the furnace in the church so that everybody could have heat. You see, that's a man who was willing to show, like Jesus, that though great, he was willing to serve. We all have an attitude of selflessness, of service, and of sacrifice. Look at what he says in verse 8. And he humbled himself, and it being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. There are people who are willing to say, say I'm, I'll be willing to put others first if it's easy. If it doesn't really cost me anything, if it doesn't really mean giving up what I want, yeah, I'll put your needs ahead of mine. I, I'm willing to serve as long as it doesn't take too much of my time. When it comes to costing, when it comes to sacrifice, we're not so willing. But Jesus was willing to sacrifice even to the point of death. Dr. J.H. Jowett said many years ago that ministry that costs nothing accomplishes nothing. What are you willing to give up for others? How much are you willing to give up for the good of the church, for the cause of Christ? We can see there's very plainly the essentials of humble service. There's this example of humble service 
You cannot miss the exaltation of our humble Savior. Notice there it says in verse 9, therefore. Anytime I've said before, anytime you're reading the Bible and you find a therefore, you need to ask why it's there, what it's there for. He's explaining that what is come before now explains that which is come after. And he says this, it was because of his humiliation that Jesus is exalted. Because he went to the cross, he rose out of that tomb. And because of he descended at his incarnation, he ascended, he ascended at his exaltation. And because he came the first time to deliver, he's coming the second time with dominion. He says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him that name which is above every name. I had a New Testament professor by the name of uh, Dr. Tom Schreiner at Southern Seminary. And I remember I was sitting in class one day, and I've probably told you this before, but I was sitting in class, and we were talking about Philippians chapter 2, and I raised my hand. I said, Dr. Schreiner, I have a question. I, I don't get this passage. I said, wasn't he already God before he took on humanity? He said, yes. I said, well, well how could he get any higher? You can't really be greater than God, can you? So, so if he stepped down, still being God, but took on human flesh, how could God exalt him any higher than he was already exalted? He said, like this. He said, he was already at the very highest place you could ever be in the universe as God, but he was not at the highest place you could be as man. And said, he took on as a human, not only as God, but then as a human the highest place and rank in all of the universe. I believe that's why Paul says in Acts chapter 17 that God has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness, notice this, by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of all this by raising him from the dead. Understand that Jesus Christ took on human nature and he went to the very lowest point you could go in this universe and he is now ascended to the very highest point you can go in this universe all because of his obedience to the will of God. And friend, there's going to come a day because of that when every knee will bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will be no more agnostics. There will be no more atheists. There will be no more who mock and deny the Lord Jesus Christ because every knee will bow before him. And every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Friend, I want you to understand something. That that exaltation that he has given is also a reminder to us that when we humble ourselves, that God lifts us up. We'll never be as high as Jesus. But the Bible says that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. The way up is down. You see, we need to make sure that if we're going to have unity as a church, that we keep our eyes on Jesus, our exalted Lord. C.S. Lewis, in his screw tape letters, imagines a scene when screw tape, who he says basically is Satan, is talking to a demon uh, named Wormwood. And they talk about how to keep the church from being effective. And in this conversation that Lewis imagines, he, he says, as long as they are talking about budgets and organization and who's who, they're going to be fighting and they're going to be distracted. He says, what we have to do is keep them from looking up and seeing the banners. What he's referring to is the blood-stained banner of the cross. And friend, we can spend a lot of time as a church meeting and talking about budgets and Satan he doesn't tremble one moment when we talk about how much money we're putting in this thing and how much money we're doing here. And as long as we're just ho-hum, getting along, not focused on what the main thing is, Satan's not afraid of us. Satan doesn't care. But when we're having these conversations, when we're meeting together, when we are focused on making the name of Jesus great, 
Where we're focused on taking the name of Christ to the nations and across the street and making sure that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what causes Satan to tremble in his boots. And friend, that ought to be what we're doing here at this church. That we are focused on the main thing. Our one God, our one goal, the Great Commission, and our one God, the Bible. Let me tell you, when we do that, Satan has every reason to be afraid of what God is doing at Emmanuel Baptist Church. I want to tell you, if you're here today, you say, I don't know about humble service. I don't even want to be part of your church. Well, I want you to be part of the kingdom of God. I want to see you standing with the sheep and not with the goats at the final judgment. I want you to bow your knee and confess with your tongue here today when there can be forgiveness, when there can be hope. Rather than bowing your knee and confessing with your mouth as you're judged on the final day. Because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want you to understand that today. And if you're here and you've never done that, I would just ask in a moment as the hymn of invitation is extended, I'm going to be standing down here at the front. And I would ask that wherever you're at, that you'd get out of your seat. You'd make your way into an aisle, and you'd meet me down here at the front. And I want to pray with you, and you can simply confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you will be saved. Maybe there's some of you here today, and you know that you've come to know Christ, but God is calling you to humble yourself. He's dealing with some sin in your heart. He's calling you to lay it aside. And serve him. You can do that. You can get in this altar. You can pray in your seat. Maybe there's somebody here this morning and you need to unite with this church. You say, well, some, some folks today say, well, I don't need to be a member of a church. I, I'm happy just attending. I'm happy just filling a seat. I don't, I don't need to be part. I understand, friend, when you say I don't need to be part of a local church, what you're saying is I'm going to be selfish. I, I can exist apart from the church. The church can serve me, but I don't want to get in plugged in so that I can serve others. But have this mind, which is also in Christ Jesus. Have it in yourselves and say, I'm going to plug in. I'm going to love the local church. I'm going to serve the local church. I'm going to be part. If that's your decision this morning, I'm going to ask you to come and meet me here and say, I need to join Emmanuel.